Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would cause us to feel what we have sung. And we pray, Lord, that as the psalmist summons us to praise you, you would cause our hearts to respond. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's not Christmas, but I want to remind you of Charles Dickens' story, The Christmas Carol. And in this story, there's a transformation that happens to the main character, Ebenezer Scrooge. He goes from being someone who loves his money and loves only himself to being someone, he goes from that to being someone who is joyfully giving away anything that he can. Someone who is delighted in the pleasure of other people. Someone who is eager to contribute to the needs of others. And Dickens, sorry if this disappoints you, but Dickens has cheated us. Dickens has actually uh, played with our emotions in, an, in, an, in a way that's not exactly fair. He hasn't really earned the payoff that he gets. You know, he, he toys with our emotions and he produces an emotional impact in us as we experience this story, but he hasn't really earned that emotional impact. The reason is because there's no such thing as a ghost as Christmas past, right? There's no such thing as a, as a ghost of Christmas present or a ghost of Christmas future that can come and show to someone how, how things have been in their lives, where things are now, and where things are going. That doesn't happen. But the transformation, the transformation that took place in Ebenezer Scrooge, that happens, doesn't it? People go from being selfish and greedy and, and unloving and ungiving. I don't know if that's a word. They go from that to being generous and happy and joyful and eager to serve others and liberated from greed. And, and, and part of the way that they make that change involves them understanding how things have been and how things are and how things are going to be. But, but the the, the transformation comes from the true story, doesn't it? It comes from becoming aware of the way that we've sinned against God, we're guilty before Him, and, and we stand now in peril, in need of God's grace, available in Christ, and knowing that Jesus is going to come and judge, and He's going to reward the righteous. Uh, the, the transformation and the way that Scrooge felt after uh, when he woke up Christmas morning, the way that he felt, I think, gets at the way the psalmist feels in Psalms 113 and 114. I would invite you to, to turn there, Psalms 114, 113 and 14 this morning. And so it, with the picture of, of Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge, you know, he wakes up and he realizes, I'm not dead. I'm not chained. And, and he throws up open the windows and he looks out the windows and he has life to live. And with that kind of feeling, I think the psalmist is, is saying here, still responding to Psalm 110, the, the, the installation of the triumphant priest king, the future king from David's line. So I think the psalmist is continuing to anticipate the future salvation that God is going to accomplish, a salvation that has been accomplished now in Christ. He exclaims, praise the Lord. This is a command. Praise the Lord. The Lord. And I would invite you to think about what praise is. Praise, I actually looked this up. I don't know if you've ever looked that word up. We, we hear words sometimes all the time and we don't think we need the definition. But here's the definition of praise. It's expressing approval or admiration. Praise the Lord. We could put it like this. The psalmist is, t is telling us to admire the Lord. We, you might put a word like adore in there. To adore is to regard with utmost esteem. The psalmist is urging us to pay homage or, or to render respect and reverence in response to what God has done. And what he's done is not stated here, but I think it's hinted at, as I said earlier in Psalm 107, verse, verses 2 and 3, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. 
those whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the land. This is the future expected salvation that God has now accomplished in Jesus. Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, David says. So in response to what God is going to do from the psalmist's perspective in the future through Christ, he's calling his audience to praise the Lord. He continues there in verse 1. He says, praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, these first three verses of the psalm, of, of this psalm, Psalm 113, are dominated with this praise for the name of the Lord. It's interesting, that, that particular phrase, the name of the Lord, it's only happened three times prior to this in the whole book of Psalms, and, and now we get it three times in three verses. There at the end of verse 1, praise the name of the Lord. Look at verse 2, blessed be the name of the Lord. And then the end of verse 3, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Between those two statements at the beginning of verse 2 and the end of verse 3, there are two statements that tell us about the extent of this praise. One of them has to do with time and the other has to do with space. Look at, look at this beautiful phrase at the end of verse 2, from this time forth and forevermore. Blessed be the name of the Lord, the psalmist says, from this time forth and forevermore. What he's saying is that what God has done is so significant, so important, so impressive, so worthy of admiration that his praise, once it has begun, should never cease. It should go on forever. The psalmist is asserting that God deserves praise from this time forth and forevermore. I think that's one of the Bible's beautiful phrases. It happens again in Psalm 121, verse 8. And this, this is a, another phrase that can, that can draw forth from us this, this ongoing praise. Psalm 121, verse 8 says, The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. You get it again in 125, 2. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. And, and it's also at the end of 115. 115, verse 18. We will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. If you've experienced the gospel, if, you, if, you're hard, if, you've, if you've experienced the real thing that brings about that Ebenezer Scrooge change, this is the way you feel. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Why? Because an eternal weight of condemnation was lifted from us. Because, because almighty, everlasting wrath was poured out on Christ instead of being poured out on us. So blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. If you don't feel that way, and you're a Christian, you're somebody that's experienced the new birth, the remedy, I think, is, is constant. The remedy is you need to contemplate Christ. You need to think about the cross. You need to think about God's mercy to you in Jesus. The more deeply you think about that, the more deeply you will feel this. If you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus, and you look at, at, at a verse like this and you think, why would anybody want to bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore? Keep listening to what I'm saying. Keep listening because what I'm telling you is there is a way for this guilt that you feel, and everybody feels guilt. Recently I read this, this article, I think Denny sent it to me, called The Strange Persistence of Guilt. People all over our society feel guilty, and they're, they're trying all these remedies for their guilt, remedies that don't involve things like atonement for sin or confession of what they've done wrong or you know, repentance where you, you repudiate that form of action and embrace this other form of action. People are trying all these ways to, to alleviate their guilt. If you will turn to the Lord, if you will trust in Christ, your guilt can be removed. Your shame can be taken away. And, and when that happens, we will feel, blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. That's the, that's the time extent. Look at the spatial statement of extent in ver at the beginning of verse 3. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. 
So the psalmist is saying, look, we don't just praise the Lord here in the land of Israel. We don't just praise the Lord in Jerusalem or, or perhaps in the neighboring countries. No, everywhere, everywhere the Lord is worthy of praise because there is no place that he is not creator and savior and Lord. God's, God's reign as creating king and his redemption as saving deliverer applies everywhere over all nations. So from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 113 call for everlasting all people, all places, all times to praise the Lord. And as I said, that's, that's responding to Psalm 110. And now what the psalmist is going to do is he's going to give more reasons for praising the Lord in this way in verses 4 through 9 of Psalm 113. He's going to start in verses 4 through 6 by talking about the Lord's exalted trans transcendence. So look at what he says in verse 4. He says, The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. What he's saying is that, is that God is enthroned on high. He's saying that God is over all peoples in all places, and his glory, his glory is even above the heavens. And then he invites us to, to, to contemplate these things by employing this rhetorical question in verse 5. Who is like the Lord? our God. And his answer to that is obvious, isn't it? What he's saying is that the Lord our God has no peer. The Lord our God has no equal. There is no one who can be compared with him. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated or enthroned on high. So this exalted transcendence, and now the psalmist is going to employ uh, in, in our minds, he's going to use words in such a way that, that he, he doesn't describe a picture for us, but he evokes the picture nevertheless. And the picture is that God's glory is above the heavens, above the clouds, over all nations, and God is enthroned up there. And he's massive, and he's so high and so exceedingly exalted that to look at the earth, to look at the heavens, which are high above the earth, he has to stoop down, way down low, to take a look at the earth and the heavens. Look at verse 6. Verse 5. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. He is so exalted that he has to come way down low to see us and what's going on, even in the heavens. But this God... This God who is so exalted and so transcendent, remarkably, is not what we would expect. Um, this week, uh, Jill was going over with our kids this, um, this catechism question about uh, the Bible. And the question goes, how do we know that the Bible is the Word of God? And the answer goes something like this. I may bungle it. It goes something like this. The Bible evidences itself to be the Word of God by the heavenliness of of its doctrine. The heavenliness of the Bible's doctrine, there's, there's more to the answer. That's the first part. The heavenliness, heavenliness of the Bible's doctrine, you could talk about the unexpectedness to our flesh of the Bible's doctrine. Because there are certain things, certain ways that we expect an exalted, enthroned on high, transcendent God to act. In our flesh, we expect such a God to be proud. We expect such a God to want the big, strong, attractive people. We expect such a God to be like Zeus. And he's never going to deign to help somebody else. And the, the God of the Bible is so unexpected to our sinful flesh. The Bible evidences itself to be the Word of God by the heavenliness of its doctrine. Look at verse 7. He raises the poor from the dust. This is somebody who has nothing. This is someone who has no resources. He has no home. He is in the dust. He's got nobody to help him. He can't even clean himself off. He can do nothing for himself or for this God. And this God goes down low and lifts up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy 
from the ash heap, verse 8 says, to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. That statement in, in uh, Psalm 113, verse 7 and 8, actually gets at the next part of that answer to the catechism question. The Bible evidences itself to be the word of God by the heavenliness of its doctrine, the unity of its parts. Um, that's almost a direct quotation of 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8, which was read earlier in the service. And, and that's Hannah's song, and, and that poem in 1 Samuel 2 is, is summarizing what's already happened in the book of Samuel and previewing what's going to happen in the rest of the book of Samuel. So what's happened to that point is Hannah, who was a barren woman, she couldn't have children, Look at the next verse of Psalm 113, verse 9. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. That's a lot like 1 Samuel 2, verse 5. Anyway, Hannah was barren. In her own strength, she could not produce babies. And God gave her conception. God opened her womb. And in the first chapter of Samuel, her rival wife, she was married to a man who had two wives, and the other, the other woman was boasting over her mocking her. Now, that other woman had no right to boast, did she? She didn't make herself fertile. Panina had no more control over her fertility than Hannah had over her barrenness. But Panina was boasting over Hannah and, and, and driving Hannah nuts. And Hannah sought the Lord, and the Lord opened her womb. The Lord lifted up the needy from the ash heap to make her sit with princes. He gave the barren woman a home and made her the joyous mother of children. And then it anticipates what's going to happen between David and Saul. Because all through the books of First and Second Samuel, Saul, he goes around disobeying God and setting up monuments to himself. And then claiming that he's done the will of the Lord. He, he's not repentant of his sins and his failures. David, by contrast, is humble and he's reliant and he's repentant. And the minute he's confronted with his sin and it's brought to his attention, his response is, I have sinned against the Lord. And because he's repentant and humble, the Lord forgives him. But even at the start of David's career, David was so unimpressive that when the prophet Samuel showed up to anoint one of his sons as king, Jesse didn't even bother to bring David in from the field right? Jesse passes all of his impressive, his strong, his tall, his, his good-looking sons before Samuel, and Samuel's response is, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. Do you, you must have another son somewhere. And Jesse's like, well, there's the runt out in the sheepfold. Samuel says, go call him. Go call him. That's the one that the Lord lifts up. The Lord lifts up the poor from the dust and the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes. The God of the Bible is a God who, who opens barren wombs. He's a God who lifts up the lowly. He is a God, a God of a crucified king. You know, in the, in the, in the world in which Jesus was crucified, crucifixion proved that you weren't the Messiah. But the God of the Bible is the God of the crucified king who rose from the dead. And the God of the Bible is the God who, there's this pattern of, of barren woman across the Old, Old Testament, Sarah, Hannah, Samson's mother, they're all barren and then the Lord opens their wombs. That pattern is going to culminate when a virgin gives birth. And the God of the Bible is one who chooses things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are, as Denny recently preached from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. So I wonder how you feel about yourself here this morning. I wonder if you feel, we, we all have reason to feel that we are the poor who have been lifted up from the dust to sit with princes, lifted up from the ash heap to sit with the princes of the peoples. Why? Because the Bible says that those who trust in Christ will reign with him, will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And if you sit here and you feel like, I don't know how I could ever occupy such a throne, such a place of judgment, that's the way you ought to feel. That's right. That's a good feeling. And the point, as, as this psalm makes and as the next psalm is going to make, the point is God is the one who is powerful. 
God is the one who is worthy of praise. God is the one who is to be extolled and adored in response to all this because God is the one who is being merciful. Psalm 113 begins and ends with the words, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord at the beginning of 113, praise the Lord at the end of 113. And and it's interesting how this ties it to its neighbors. Look at the opening words of 111, praise the Lord. Opening words of 112, praise the Lord. And then you have 113 that opens and closes with praise the Lord. And then look at the end of 115, praise the Lord. End of 116, Praise the Lord. You get it at the beginning and end again of 117. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And then that's where it stops. So uh, the, the preceding psalms begin with praise the Lord, and the following psalms, except for 117, end with praise the Lord. Psalm 114, the next psalm, doesn't use praise the Lord, which uh, this, this in Hebrew, praise the Lord is hallelujah. So Psalm 114 doesn't even have hallelujah here. I still like it, though. That's okay. It's still a good psalm. Unlike its neighbors, it doesn't use hallelujah. Instead, what it does is it begins, 114.1, with a reference to the exodus from Egypt, and then it ends in 114.8 with a reference to Israel's time in the wilderness. Um, So at the beginning and the end, you have exodus and wilderness. And then look at verse 2. Judah became his sanctuary. Um, The sanctuary is like the temple, so you have a reference to God's presence. Look at verse 7, tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. So two references to presence in verse 7. So you have Exodus, wilderness, presence, presence, and then in the middle, you have creation's response to the Lord. And and the, the elements of creation our first, first, their reaction to the Lord is going to be described, and then they're going to be mocked, in a sense. They're going to be taunted in response to the way that they reacted to the Lord. This is a really interesting psalm. This psalm, it's almost comical. It, there's a jubilant playfulness uh, in, in, in Psalm 114. It, it's as though the psalmist is laughing with delight over what God has done. But then 115, it's like it quickly sobers up. Look at 115.1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name get glory. It's it's almost like the psalmist is saying, I don't want to get carried away here. Uh, You're the one who deserves the glory. So look at at Psalm 114, verse 1. When Israel went out from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language. Now, why would the psalmist start this way? Why would he start with a reference to the Exodus that alludes to the strange language of the Egyptians? I think maybe what he's doing is thinking about the way that Isaiah, Isaiah 28, 10 through 13, threatens that God is going to judge Israel with a people whose language they don't understand. And so I think what he's doing is he's saying, look, we came out from a people of strange language and we're in exile And we're expecting deliverance from a people of strange language. So I think the past salvation is pointing forward to the future salvation. And then verse 2, Judah became his sanctuary. Okay, so I think this is about Solomon building the temple in Jerusalem in the land of Judah, right? Uh, Judah became his holy place. Israel, the land of Israel that God gave to the people, his dominion. So the place where God is present and the place where God reigns, that's that's what Israel and Judah became. God's people, after the Exodus, were in God's place under God's law. And, And it was only anticipated, though, wasn't it? After the Exodus from Egypt, when they came into the land, yes, God's people, God's place, God's law, but not, not then as it will be in the new heavens and new earth. So again, I think... The past is being used to anticipate the future. And then here in verses 3 and 4 is where this psalm begins to get really interesting, I think, and and fun. Because it's almost like the psalmist, it's almost as though 
uh, these statements come with a twinkle in his, in his eye and a hint of laughter in their articulation. And, and what the psalmist is going to do is he's going to talk about the Lord's triumphs at the Exodus, and he focuses on the Lord's impact on creation. So look at verses 3 and 4. The sea looked and fled. Jordan turned back. So he just skips there from Red Sea to Jordan River. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. You know what this is like? This is like my kids watching highlights. Look at the way that Steph Curry broke Chris Paul's ankles. Look at the way he crossed him over there. Look, he just almost fell down in response to that. The psalmist here is celebrating with almost laughter in his voice at the greatness of God. And notice how the parting of the Red Sea, the sea looked and fled. He doesn't say anything about Israel there, does he? Do you remember what Israel was doing? Moses, why did you bring us out here to get us killed? Right? They're quailing. They're desperate in fear. He doesn't say anything about Moses. You remember what Moses did? Moses lifts up the staff, right? And the water's part. Moses is not the focus. Israel's desperate fear is not the focus. The focus is Yahweh arriving in majesty. And then the, it's, the sea is like personified. The sea sees him coming, and the sea is like, I got to get out of here. The only thing I can do in response to him is flee. So Yahweh arrives, and he so startles the sea that it can only run. The panicking people, Moses with his staff, neither of the almighty deliverer is the focus of attention. It's like he's laughing with delight. And then, then he starts taunting after, after celebrating this. Look at, look at verse 5. What ails you, O.C.? What's wrong with you, waters? You know? What ails you, O.C., that you flee? O oh, Jordan, that you turn back. Where are you going? You've had enough already? O oh, mountains, that you skip like rams. By the way, I think that could, that could either be talking about Mount Sinai, you know, God comes down on the mountain, and the mountain starts to rumble. This, this massive, immovable rock begins to move at the coming of the presence of God. So the mountains, or it, it could be a literal reference to the earthquake when God came down at Mount Sinai, or it could be anticipating the land's joyful response when God comes into the land of Israel, accompanying the people of Israel. Oh, mountains that you skip like, land, like rams, oh, hills like lambs. So I don't know if it's a literal earthquake or just characterizing the land's joy at the coming of the Lord. Uh, but, but the psalmist is clearly taunting the, the, the elements of creation, the, the sea, the Jordan River, the mountains, and the hills. I, I'm not a soccer fan. I don't watch soccer. Is, is it even a sport? Any, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. I, yeah, I know. There's a famous commentator, though, that I would almost watch soccer just to listen to this guy, this guy named Ray Hudson. And um, re you may have seen this clip or read about it this past April. Uh, Lionel Messi, I, maybe I'm saying his name right, wrong, I don't know. Lionel Messi, this, this uh, famous soccer player, he scores this goal for Barcelona to, to beat Real Madrid 3-2 uh, to two back in, in this past April. And this guy, Ray Hudson, his narration, as I was thinking about these these uh, verses, I thought of his um, commentary. Um, so, so evidently, he's, he's, he somewhat commonly will refer to, when somebody makes a, a great play, he'll call the soccer player the medicine man, all right? So, so this is Ray Hudson's celebration over the medicine man, Lionel Messi, once he scored this goal. He says... Uh, Jake wanted me to get uh, Paul to play this clip, but you can't find the clip anymore. The, the soccer people have taken it down off the internet, so I couldn't find it. But anyway, this is what he says. He says, the medicine man arrives and sinks his flaming spear into the hearts of Real Madrid. Astonishing from Messi. Beautiful counterattack. All the pieces falling into place. Messi Born in the crossfire hurricane, and he is jumping Jack Flash right here. Amazing football. The defenders are left with bees flying around them. Messy. And then listen to this. He says, you could drop a tarantula into his shorts and he'd still be cool. 
That's the way the psalmist is responding to the Lord. I mean, this is this guy, Ray Hudson, he's praising Lionel Messi, isn't he? And this is the way that the psalmist is responding to the Lord. He's saying, look at what God did to the elements of creation. The sea could only run from him. The Jordan had to turn back. The mountains were skipping around like young animals romping through a field. And the hills were doing likewise at the coming of Yahweh. And then in verse 7, tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord. That word there for tremble, you could, you could also ren render that word writhe. Writhe, O earth, at the presence of the Lord. And that particular word for writhe is often used of a woman writhing in childbirth. And I think that maybe there's a, a hint of through the Lord coming in this way, birth pangs are coming upon creation that are going to bring about the new celebration. And it's prompted, it's prompted by the presence of the Lord. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. And then he continues to celebrate the Lord who turns the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a spring of water. Now think about what the psalmist has done here. What was the Red Sea doing? It was preventing the people of Israel from escaping the Egyptians, right? What was the Jordan River doing? It was preventing the people of Israel from entering into the land of promise. What was the rock there in verse 8 doing? Well, it wasn't giving water, was it? It wasn't keeping the people of Israel alive. So I think what the psalmist is saying is something like this. There is nothing that can hinder God from saving His people. You can put a sea in front of God's people and God is going to get them through. You can put an, a rushing river that is overflowing its banks at that time of year and God is going to get His people through. You can put them out in a desert with, a, with nothing but flint and rock and God is going to give His people water. So I would invite you to take whatever's going on in your life. If you're here this morning and you're an unbeliever, do you know that not even your unbelief can stand against the Lord? If you will really encounter Him, you will find that your doubts and your skepticism are crumbling. If, if you will consider Christ, if you, I, I challenge you, if you're an unbeliever here this morning, you just start reading the book of Matthew and you keep reading. You keep reading and you see if your skepticism about Jesus of Nazareth doesn't begin to get swept away in these accounts of his greatness. And you see if you don't start to feel trust in him. Maybe you're here and you're a believer and you're saying, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sick of my pride. If you will encounter God like this, you know what you'll feel? Small. If you realize that he is the Lord who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth, you'll start to feel like nothing. And that's the way it, you should feel. You'll start to feel like the needy and the poor who've been lifted up from the ash heap and you don't deserve any of the credit. That's the way we ought to feel. Your lust doesn't stand a chance against the Lord. If you will encounter him, you will find a satisfaction in knowing God that will surpass anything that you are tempted to lust after. Your greed, a God that can provide water from the rock, manna from heaven, a God who can, who can sell some of the cattle on a thousand hills and provide for you, your anger, your sloth, whatever it is that you're dealing with. If creation can't stop him, your sin won't either. The medicine man will, really will arrive and plant the flaming spear into the heart of the enemy. God is going to accomplish the good work that he has begun in us. He will do it. So this, this is kind of a celebratory taunt song here in Psalm 114. And, and, and I would encourage you to take the words of this song and, and apply it to your own life. And then taunt your, your sins 
And, and, and the things that would stand between you and the new heavens and new earth, because God is going to conquer. He is the triumphant Lord. He is the almighty deliverer, and he will have his way. Let's pray together. Father, there is no doubt that you deserve praise at all times and in every place. From this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting, Lord, your name is to be praised. Because the sea can't stop you, the rivers won't thwart you, and the mountains won't stand in your way. The mountains will be made into valleys, and the valleys will be exalted, and you will come. And Father, we praise you and thank you. We don't deserve to be among those celebrating your arrival, welcoming your kingdom, but in your great mercy, you have brought your word to us. You have made us alive by the power of the Spirit, and you've given us faith. And we pray, Lord, that you would make us, make us those who have experienced the, tri the transformation that happened to Scrooge, and make us those who are generous and loving and others-centered and giving and joyful. Make us those who praise you always, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.